What is up engine heads? Today we'll be tearing down an engine, this engine. And as we tear it down, we're going to analyze it, we're going to do some forensics, and we're going to see how each of its parts is going to play a role in Project Underdog, my turbo build of this very engine. So our engine is a 1.6 liter Toyota 4A FE engine that comes from a 1997 Toyota Avensis from the UK. My plan is to turbocharge this engine to 300 horsepower and stuff it into my Toyota MR2 Mark 1. I picked this engine up from a local junkyard and so far it seems to be in pretty nice condition, without any critical obvious faults. Today I'm going to tear it down to see what's it like inside and to prepare it for machining. We're going to start our teardown by removing the intake manifold. Now the intake manifolds on the 4A FE engines are often described as being unsuitable for high performance. Uh, as you can see, the intake runners make this sort of weird S shape, uh, which isn't ideal for airflow. On the other side, the throttle body is also pretty small and the intake plenum itself is pretty small too. But despite of this, I want to use this intake manifold at least in the early stages of my build. I want to see if it really is that bad and I want to see what kind of performance I can squeeze out of it with forced induction. If it does prove to be a limiting factor to performance, I will replace it with a custom intake manifold or at least I'll replace the throttle body. Speaking of the throttle body, I do like this big comfy return spring and I do like the feeling of the throttle in general. I also like that the throttle body features a standard 3-pin throttle position sensor, which means it's really easy to hook up to pretty much any standalone ECU. The coolant hoses for the idle air control valve are absolutely rotten, so they're going into the trash bin to get over the vacuum hoses from the throttle body because I won't be using either in my future setup. The intake manifold is a two-piece design, so we can split it and take a peek into the size and the shape of the plenum inside. The intake plenum is indeed small and the shape isn't that great either, but I am impressed with the lack of carbon buildup and dirt and other kinds of junk you can usually find on the inside of an intake manifold. This seems to suggest that this engine definitely is in good shape and that it didn't have a lot of blow-by, because the PCV hose is directly connected to the intake manifold. The other side of the manifold seems to reveal a pretty weird and unusual design. A bit of oil residue right here, but other than that, it's definitely very, very clean. I have to be honest that I'm unsure of what these circular things are actually for. They seem to capture the oil residue, but other than that, I have to be honest, I have no idea if they do or do not have any additional purposes. I do like that the entries into the runners are smooth and rounded off to improve airflow, but other than that, it's pretty obvious that performance wasn't the goal in the design of this intake manifold. Here's a look at the intake ports of the 4A FE engine. I really like this design. It's a really straight path for the air onto the intake valves. And this is one of the key reasons why I'm using this engine. And I believe that this design is actually superior to the design of the intake ports on the more performance oriented 4A GE engine. And here's a little rule of thumb. When looking through the intake port of an engine, if you can see almost the entire back side of the valve, it's a good intake port design. Next up, it's time to remove the exhaust manifold. I'm pretty surprised by the lack of rust on the heat shield. The exhaust manifold is actually a really nice steel unit, definitely a step up from the cast iron manifolds you can find in many 4A engines. This is actually performance friendly and it looks nice too. 
Now the exhaust ports themselves are, as expected, of a pretty modest size and they will need porting for turbo purposes. However, there's a challenge there because the number one exhaust port sits very close to an oil drain passageway, but I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. The situation under the valve covers is fortunately pretty nice, a nice golden hue. Seems somebody was changing their oil on time, whoever you are, thank you. The timing belt on the other hand seems to have some sort of mold on it, something totally weird, a bit of sand on it, I don't know, kind of disgusting honestly. As you can see, the 4AFE features a different cam drive arrangement compared to a 4AGE, which is a true dual overhead cam engine. This has only a single large cam gear driven by the belt, and it's situated on the exhaust camshaft. And then the exhaust camshaft drives the intake camshaft via these two scissor gears. This means that on the 4AFE, the exhaust camshaft turns clockwise, but the intake camshaft turns counterclockwise. Now this is different than on an engine where each camshaft has its own belt driven cam gear, where both camshafts usually turn clockwise. And although installing adjustable cam gears on an engine where each camshaft has its own belt driven cam gear gives you more adjustability than in this system where it's only possible to install one adjustable belt driven cam gear, this system also has its advantages. And the advantage is that the cylinder head is narrower in this system because the camshafts are closer to each other. And this gives you more space in the engine bay. And this will be pretty useful for me because it will give me more space for a turbo manifold. This being a second generation 4AFE, the camshafts feature a bit more lift and a bit more duration compared to the first generation 4AFE engines. However, this is still a relatively mild camshaft profile. When it comes to valve lash, the 4AFE, just like the 16 valve 4AGE engines, features a shim over bucket arrangement. The disgusting sand mold is especially strong under the timing belt covers, as you can see. A few more of these and I can build myself a mini beach. Also, there's a nice little row of bug cocoons neatly stacked right next to each other. Just like the 4AGE, the 4AFE relies on a spring for belt tensioning. This spring pulls on the tensioner and provides tension to the belt. On engines with a lot of miles, this spring can get tired and provide insufficient tensioning, which means that sometimes uh, the belt can skip a tooth. So many people actually prefer to manually tension the belt on these kinds of engines. Interestingly, although it's completely rusted out from the outside, the belt tensioner pulley seems to be in great condition and doesn't make any weird noises when it's rotated. To access the cylinder head bolts, I need to remove both of the camshafts. And camshaft removal starts with the removal of the distributor. And as you can see, the distributor is directly driven by the exhaust camshaft.
there seems to be no major critical issues with any of the camshaft bearings some of them do have a bit of wear and some tiny scratches but nothing too concerning The rule for unbolting cylinder heads, crankshafts and camshafts is the same. Always start from the outside and work your way in, unbolting the bolts in several passes. Before removing the cylinder head, the water pump needs to come off. The situation in the cylinder head was great and oil seems to have been changed in time but I can't say the same for coolant. It looks like coolant was never changed and the tap water was used because things look absolutely horrible. The pistons look great, nothing weird or concerning, uh, just a bit of carbon buildup, but that's totally normal. Uh, the debris you can see is just from me lifting up the cylinder head. There's also no signs of head gasket failure, which is always a good thing. The bores look great too, basically a mirror finish, which was honestly expected considering the low blow-by we have seen in the intake manifold. When it comes to the bores, this engine would have likely done a lot more miles without any issues. Although the 4AFE and 4AGE pistons feature the same bore, as you can see the design of the valve cutouts is pretty different. The 4AGE have significantly deeper valve cutouts because the valve included angle on the 4AGE engine is different to the valve included angle on the 4AFE which is more narrow. Now here's another little tip, before you turn over the cylinder head make sure to take a permanent marker and write down the location on each of the valve buckets because when you turn over the cylinder head they will fall out and you might mix them up. Now the 4AFE combustion chambers feature a pretty unusual design, although they are of a pentroof type, this isn't what you usually see when looking at a pentroof combustion chamber. As you can see they have this additional material here and here and I believe the purpose of this was to improve squish, however I will be grinding away or porting away uh, some of this material in order to increase combustion chamber capacity and reduce the compression ratio. So more disgusting stuff in the coolant system, I honestly expected this seeing what the situation was like around the water pump. So yeah, something else that's weird is the head gasket. As you can see the holes on the head gasket and on the cylinder head do not match up. It does say 4AFE on the head gasket but the situation with the holes not matching up is honestly totally weird but I don't care because I will be replacing this head gasket with a proper multi-layer steel head gasket. So there are some metal shavings in the oil sump, I have no idea where they came from and this usually isn't a good sign, but this engine will be getting a complete rebuild so even if they did damage the main and rod bearings I won't be too concerned honestly. So the last thing that needs to come out before I can remove the crankshaft is of course the connecting rods and the pistons.
Now the carnage you see me doing to the oil pump here is the unfortunate consequence of something that does quite often happen when disassembling a 4A engine and that's the crankshaft timing gear being stuck onto the crankshaft. Of course the issue is rust and these things like to be seized onto the crankshaft and removing them is an absolute nightmare. Now you cannot get this thing off using a gear puller because there's not enough space for the legs of the gear puller to slide in and I'm pretty sure Toyota has some sort of specialized tool for this but I don't have this so oil pump carnage is unfortunately my only option here. So everything is out and I have to say that I'm impressed with how well the rod and the main bearings look. Uh, there's zero signs of abnormal wear or damage. Uh, the only thing I have found is this tiny scratch right here uh, on the number one connecting rod. This likely happened because of those shavings we found in the oil sump. A tiny shaving might have made it past the sump and created this damage. And although I don't really care as I won't be reusing any of these internals, I'm still happy to see an engine that was well taken care of. So here it is. The teardown is complete and the 4AFE is in pieces. In the following episodes of Project Underdog, I'll be revealing what kind of upgrades I plan to do to this engine to turn it into a real performer. So stay tuned and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.